yeah, let's get started. So we're going to go back to talking about um, the argument that Baron and Grimm made in addressing diversity in the Writing Center, because that is the foundation for the argument and the research that you're going to be doing in the next essay. But I think it's important to pause and think about what an argument is. I mean, if I'm asking you to make an argument, I'm gonna want you to make a good argument. There really is no point in not doing that. And so, um, so that's where we're headed today. We're gonna look at, um, we're gonna look at, uh, what are we gonna look at? We're, yeah, we're gonna look at finding the good argument. Um, I asked, I hope you have a copy with you, but if not, I just put um, the link in the chat. And so you can access it that way. Um, before we move on to Rebecca Jones and finding the good argument, um, I, I wanna say, related to the discussions that we're having about diversity in the Writing Center. I just wanna affirm the thing that you all are already doing. And I saw this in the discussion boards, which I finished reading yesterday and today, is that you really are respecting all perspectives. And when you're thinking you might want to disagree or you don't understand what somebody is saying, um, you're asking questions and you're listening. And I really, really appreciate that. I also appreciate, um, I remember at least one student said, I don't understand this part of the quotation. Um, can somebody explain it to me? And I loved that you were engaging and asking those questions of each other. And then there was another post too, and I don't remember which, two people were involved in the questioning, but they were asking questions back and forth. It really was like a true discussion. The, there was an initial post and somebody had responded and then the person to that initial post and then the person, I am not saying this right, but it was a back and forth. It was a true dialogue, not just a like an academic, I'm putting an answer there and now I'm done. And I, and I appreciate that because I think that as we listen to perspectives, as we ask each other questions, as we engage in this process of discovering and learning together, we're going to do this. And so I affirm what you're already doing, um, respect, listen, if you're not sure about something, ask rather than um, calling people out. Another thing that I really loved that you were doing um, in your reading journals and in the discussion board is you were referencing current events, specific things that have happened in this last year, specifically since, um, the death of um, George Floyd and um, alluding to other civil rights protests and things Martin Luther King said, and you were synthesizing these ideas. And I love that you were doing that. It shows me that you're not just thinking about what Baron and Grimm said, but you're thinking of it in light of what you already know. And I wanna emphasize this idea that um, if we wanna understand what's happening within a university, we have to consider the context in which people live, the context um, in which Baron and Grimm were writing and the context in which we are reading this. Things have changed, have they changed Enough? No, in fact, I would say some things are worse. Um, back in 2002, we wouldn't have seen neo-Nazis or Klansmen um, in the streets protesting, very rarely. Uh, and now that seems to be something we see a lot. 
and um, we can analyze why, but all of that matters, all of that matters as we join the conversation that Baron and Grimm started back in 2002. Um, and if we want to see how this connects with previous conversations, we have to examine previous conversations. This was 20 years ago. And a lot has been written since then. And so most of your homework this week is focusing on ge getting familiar with other discussions. I'm showing you the reading journal that's due this week. And you will see, um, you will see that I've given you links to a lot of these conversations. Um, I'm really just scratching the surface. And um, you can choose any one of these articles to read. Um, some of them focus on training tutors on how to interact with diversity, such as addressing the everyday language of oppression in the writing center. Um, another article talks about the new racism that you saw alluded to in the article. Um, grounding difficult conversations. Um, so they, Baron and Grimm talk about difficult conversations. Um, here's learning to write in the writing center, social change in routine practices, unmasking, unmaking gringo centers, exploring white privilege in the writing center. Can a writing center reverse the new racism? Um, there's an article, did I include it? Um, should writers use they own English? I think um, Michaela asked about, you know, like, did I learn to write white? Did I learn, you know, like, what did I learn? And this writing center director asks, um, should we enforce standard American written English? Or should we allow students to write in their own dialects? Which I think is a good question to ask um, if we're thinking about productive um, diversity. Um, and I want you to think about, you know, like we're extending Grimm's conversation to uh, focus on you know, like all types of diversity, racial diversity, gender diversity, um, even disability diversity. There's an article in here um, where Nancy Grimm is talking about, you know, like how do we include um, writers with disabilities? And so you're gonna start by reading and analyzing a text just to become familiar with the direction of the conversations that follow that one. And then um, you're going to introduce that text on the discussion board to sort of share it with other people. So you can be familiar with the articles you didn't read. And then next Monday, we will develop, um, I think, five to six different groups, and you'll be signing up for a group based on the topic that you'll be exploring. Um, does that make sense? Any questions about where we're headed here? So we're putting, we're going into groups based on the article that we read, or I'm not sure what you mean by like what direction we're going in. So, so, um, in Baron and Grimm's article, they're exploring and describing what they learned by introducing um, diversity training in their writing center. That's the focus, is like, we did this thing, here's the lessons we learned so that you can consider those when you do this work in your own writing center their writings to writing center employees, mostly directors and administrators in a writing center. Here's what we learned 
and how that can inform you. But they also introduce, that's their focus, but they introduce some really key things like how do you develop colorblindness in a writing center? What does colorblindness look like? What forms of institutional racism, systemic racism, do we see in a university? How do we counter um, attitudes of white supremacy from people who are pretty nice people, but they don't realize that they have racist or, um, or attitudes that privilege um, white ways of thinking. And so they've got all these topics. And so by reading the conversation, we want to develop the topics we want our class to focus on. Because I can't just say, write about diversity. That's too broad. Write about diversity in a writing center. Still, that's too broad. They narrowed it to, here's the lessons we learned from diversity training with our tutors. We want to narrow it into some distinct topics that allow you to collaborate with other people in building research. Does that help explain the direction, Andy? Yeah, sorry. I was looking for my microphone button. Yeah, I know. I find that unmute button. It's it, sometimes when I'm in a hurry, it's really hard to find. Um, yeah. The, I want you to collaborate in your groups to find research that attempts to ask an or answer or help you understand um, more focused topics. And so you can collaborate with finding the research. And that way you'll be familiar with the conversations that each other are entering into and you're these will be your peer reading groups for this, your research sharing groups, your research collaboration groups, um, but you're being graded on your own essay. Any other questions about what we'll be doing? Okay, so now we're back to, um, the rest of everything. By the way, I, I like to, if we were in a real classroom, this is a real cl classroom, but you know what I mean. If we were in a physical space, the kind that we wish we were in most days, except for the days when we, you know, like don't really want to put on shoes or um, walk to a classroom. Um, I would call on students and I will be doing this. Um, and I'll call on you randomly. Um, I, can, I can create a list and I see, you know, like the next person on my list is Derek and then is Andy and then Mari and then Kristen and Anna and Connor. And so I see these names. Um, most of the time I don't have them there because, you know, like they block the PowerPoint, but um, I will call on you randomly. The other thing that I'll do, because we'll be divided into groups um, to discuss this, is I might call on a group. I might say group two. And if I call on group two, group two should, um, somebody should be ready to speak up, or you can name a spokesperson in your group. And that way we don't have long pauses there. Um, if you don't respond in the chat or, you know, like, so we can hear you, I'm going to assume you're not present. That happened in, in my other class where I called on a student and she didn't answer. And I thought, well, she's just, you know, like struggling with her microphone. Um, but then at the end of class, she stayed there. And it was weird. So anyways, that's, that's that. Be prepared to speak up, even if you want to say, I don't really understand that question, so. So first thing I'm gonna do, um, by the way, um, you can access 
this PowerPoint, um, you can access this PowerPoint um, through Canvas and um, it's already there. I probably should have shared it with you. So let me stop the share. And um, let me take this out. Um, I'm gonna put it in our chat. I think that that's gonna be the easiest thing for us. So you don't have to go into Canvas. Um, I don't want you editing it at all. So um, this will allow you to create a copy. And I'm gonna put you in, um, let me go back to the slideshow. Um, I've created a series of, actually this one doesn't matter. So this is, this is the slide I want you to focus on. I just want you to, I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms and I want you to talk about your first impressions of this text with each other. I'll just give you a few, um, um, I'll give you a few minutes to answer this idea of first impressions. That's the only slide you need to make, pay attention to, but you should, um, but you should make note of which room you're in. Okay, there you go. You now have an invitation to talk about first impressions. Okay, first impressions. Group five. What did your group talk about? Uh, first off, we talked about like how it was different from what we were reading. So like going in, it was like, okay, after reading Baron and Grimm's essay, we were like, okay, this is like pretty, just like straight up, we're going to tell you how it is. But then starting uh, Jones's, it was like, it was a lot more friendly, you know, with like the introduction of like the comic ship. It's like, you didn't expect to see something of that nature to show up. So we were just like kind of focusing on how friendly it was. And I don't, yeah, just pretty much how friendly it was. Yeah, it's super inviting. Um, did it have, did any of you actually watch the, the clip from The Daily Show? Yeah, I did. It, it was in terrible quality, though, like 240p. <laughs> I was looking at pixels on the screen. Oh, yeah. Well, it was a long time ago. Um, she wrote this in, um, I think it was published in 2010. And uh, the internet and uh, YouTube were not quite in the same quality. Um, I, other first impressions, group um, six. Um, we talked about how there was just like a lot of new concepts that we haven't hadn't really thought about before. Which ones, Roxanne? Um, <laughs> I think I don't. We talked about like specifically how we didn't, hadn't read a lot about like color blindness in writing. Oh, I mean, in finding the good argument. Oh, uh, oh, oh, what? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah I we think talked about finding the good argument. Oh, today. we talked about the wrong <laughs> one then. Yeah. Oh, well, that's okay. That's okay. Um, we will have more time to talk about Baron and Grimm on Wednesday. And we're not done talking about Rebecca Jones and finding the good argument. Um, by the way, you can see the link to that article in the chat. So for next time. Um, group eight, what were your first impressions? So what we talked about was, yeah, how friendly it is, but 
we we described it more as interactive where it started off with a comic as like a friendly inviting way of of getting your readers attention but as we read on it gives you like an interactive activity to answer questions and I was expressing my confusion about that. I'm like, huh, I didn't know you could do that in writing. But uh, then Anna pointed out to me that, wait, this is part of a book. This is an excerpt from like a textbook. And that made a whole lot more sense to me. And um, what stood out to us is how they described argumentation as dancing rather than war. And that, that really struck me because I, when I read that, I thought they were like going in the direction of this isn't going to be a war. It's going to be more like a sports match where at the end they're going to be like, all right, good game. I see that as argumentation. But when they said dancing, I'm like, huh? <laughs> dancing. So. Yeah, seriously. I, I mean, like most of the time when we think of argumentation, we don't think of sports match even. Um, think about Think about the debates we saw. Um, I, if any of you watched either of the debates that we've had present, um, they were very warlike. And, you know, like the goal is just win, win, win. And um, not to have some kind of dance or even a sports match. It's pretty remarkable. Um, I, a few of you mentioned that comic. I, I want to bring this up so you can see it. Um, I know I made it really big. And so, the quality isn't great, but you've got a copy of the text also. It's this whole thing of light as a particle. It's a wave, it's a particle, it's a wave, it's a particle, it's a wave. Um, let's stop our petty bickering and resolve this like professional scientists and then they battle each other's. And then she makes the claim, we imagine our ideas battling each other when we write an academic paper. And what is the irony of this comic? Anybody? I think um, the irony of it is that they say, resolve it like professional scientists and you'd expect them to be like very civil to each other and have actual evidence behind it, but they just start fighting and it's like not academically stimulating at all. Yes. Now I do hope that professional scientists are a little more, I, I, you know, like a little more civil than that. Um, but I guess, I guess my question is, is, is light a wave or a particle? It's both. it's both. Yeah. I mean, like super ironic. It's both things. It's not one thing or the other that one side we can have an, a war to win and say we're right because what, what the dog and the cat are not realizing or not what they're not acknowledging is that both things can be true simultaneously. We can potentially, we could have capitalism and socialism at the same time. And by socialism, I mean the true definition of socialism is that the government pays for some things. Um, if you are, if you attend, if you're a California resident, the government is subsidizing your education. You may feel like you're paying a lot, but all our tax dollars are subsidizing that education. Well, that's a form of socialism. And, and when you hear that, you might go, ah. but when we drive on streets that we didn't have to like pay a toll tax, that's taxation going for the common good, which is the basic definition of socialism. But capitalism can have some strong attributes too. And so, Things can both exist, but you wouldn't think so from watching political ads. I don't know. I Maybe you've been avail, able to avoid those. I am looking forward to the day when the election is over. So it's ironic. An argument shouldn't be a battle. So um, now that we've got those first impressions out of the way, 
um, I want to talk about this idea of a metaphor of war. Now, if you ever want to analyze the use of a metaphor as a rhetorical strategy, you have to know how they work. And a metaphor compares one thing to another, often an abstract concept or an unfamiliar person or thing to another thing using something that's familiar to the audience. So essentially this thing X equals Y. We know X, we don't know Y. So by thinking about the characteristics of X, we can understand Y which we're not familiar with, and we can understand it and a little bit better. So you want to identify and describe characteristics of the known object, and then you analyze how those characteristics apply to the unknown object and how they influence the audience's perception of the unknown object, concept, or person. So I like to, it's always fun in a classroom, um, I've never done this online before, but we're about to start that. Um, this, this quote from Juliet, but soft, but light through yonder window breaks. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Now in this, in this scene, the audience has not yet met Juliet. And so Romeo is saying, Juliet, who you do not know, she is like the sun. So to apply this metaphor, we have to think, what are some characteristics of the sun that Romeo wants to wants us to see when we think about Juliet? So when we meet her, we go, oh, she's like that. And just in the chat, um, which I'm going to pull up, um, what are some characteristics of the sun? Juliet is radiant. She's warm, she's bright. She's life-giving. Any others that you can think of? This is the point where everybody has said the really nice things that somebody in the class will say something like Sulema just said. She's burning, she's smoldering, Derek said. Um, somebody will say she's hot and everybody in the class laughs at that point. And, um, and then somebody will say, well, actually no essential to existence. Oh, I love this. And this is the point where in the class, I would say none of you have said she's a fiery ball of gas that will blind you if you look directly at her. Why? Because instinctively we know to choose, we're comparing to a person. So we instinctively, we know to choose characteristics. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, I, I think it's gas, I am not positive. But um, instinctively we know to take characteristics of that are positive that we associate with, um, well, I love all the things that I'm learning in, in the chat. I appreciate this, but instinctively we know to take characteristics. And so this is the point where um, we come back into the text and we realize that um, we really do associate argument with war. Okay, so at the rest of the slides I've got here, um, group one, you get an easy slide. You're not gonna be writing on this slide, um, but I want you to take notes and be ready to share with us when we come back into the class. Um, group two, you have a longer question because you actually have three slides and you're analyzing this language as metaphor, argument as war. You're like, what does it mean? I've got some questions there. Group four, you're just looking at this whole thing. What are some examples of yes, no arguments that Jones identifies? 
Can you think of others? What are the problems? Group five, you get to analyze this very complex quotation. Group six, you get to analyze this quotation. And group seven, you get to analyze this quotation. And I made eight groups, um, which means that group eight, go ahead and do group sevens. And so there'll be two of you doing group seven, okay? So I'm just gonna send you back to your rooms and um, talk about the slide that is associated with you. I'm sorry, I don't think you mentioned group three. Group three, you get, um, there's group two and three are doing the same set of questions. Okay, thanks, got it. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. Um, let me go ahead and share the screen. And I think, I think I'm gonna jump around a little bit. Um, and group one, um, I am gonna jump around. Who is the primary audience for this text? So we said that the primary, Sorry, the primary audience was writing students and writing teachers. And we said that we knew that, or how do you know? Um, we read like the little note at the beginning. It says, this essay is a chapter in Writing Spaces, Readings on Writing, Volume 1, a peer-reviewed open textbook series for the writing classroom. So yeah, that's how we know, because it says for the writing classroom. Um, and we just kind of assume that since teachers would be basing this off their curriculum, that teachers would need to know this stuff as well as them teaching it to their students. Um, what does Jones assume her audience believes? We said some underlying assumptions were that they assumed that, she assumed that they saw, uh, they saw argument as war and that they kind of took on that perspective instead the argument is dance perspective and we said she used a lot of like political and news radio examples so maybe she's assuming that they watched the news or are at least somewhat knowledgeable about political issues and like the format of that yeah that was great analysis thank you andy and group one yeah and we see this throughout the text where she's and you said it was inviting. There were activities, it was interactive. She is definitely appealing to her primary audience, which is super, super important. Um, I'm going to um, group two and group three. Tell me, um, this quotation, um, group two, What's oh. the problem with all's fair in love and war, the rules, principles, and ethics of an argument are up for grabs? Uh, we were slightly cut off with time, but uh, some of the things we were able to consider is that um, although we've all heard this metaphor, it, it seems kind of um, not necessarily unrelated, but it's, it's that it's flawed in that yeah, everything should be considered, but um, I think the metaphor references love and war, which is different than war with argument. Uh, one scenario has um, principles that I think should be followed. Um, obviously, you want to have both sides of the conversation. You don't want to leave anything out because then you might be missing some of the more uh, critical points. But in the metaphor for all is fair and love and war, it's like, um, I don't know, when I think of it, I think, um, you know, if you get cheated on, then, um, you know, <laughs> do your best to backstab or things like that. I mean, then it, then it comes down to, um, you know, it was fair, you know, you asked for it, it's in the scenario of war and, um, you know, it's okay because that's the scenario. So your, I like your analysis there is like backstab, do whatever. Um, does she, I mean, like that's certainly what we are seeing in political attack ads that are often untrue or deceptive. It's what we see in misinformation 
campaigns. Um, and she's saying it's what we see on the news pretty often, actually. And so it's that argument is like to make my point, I can do anything I want. And her argument, of course, they, is no, there need to be some kind of standards. Um, group three, how might a different metaphor like dance change our understanding of an argument? What are characteristics of dance that could be applied to um, argumentation? Um, one of the things that I saw a difference in with argument as dance instead of argument as war is like, it kind of changes it from like a war situation to like a craft and like a hobby or something. And like, that's something that I like to think of, like when I'm thinking about writing and like argumentation, like crafting my argument and like forming my opinion and expressing that, like thinking of it more of like a craft and like something special that like I can do like however I want to portray my argument and like something like that, like that difference is like a different understanding than like argument as dance. Yeah, I like that. Um, we're running out of time. And so here's what I want you to do is just, just like um, we put characteristics of the sun that could be applied to Juliet. What are some characteristics of dance that could be applied to argumentation? Just go ahead and enter them into the chat. Yeah, definitely flow. It's like things rhythm. Um, it's collaborative, yeah, definitely. Um, All of these things are valuable. She's saying that argumentation, if we have the true goals of an argument, um, which is to solve a problem, to learn something, that we have to be more concerned about cooperation and collaboration and rhythm and dynamic, complementing each other, than killing each other or lying to get what to prove that we're right. And I'm keep in mind your groups for next time and right at the beginning, I'll let the rest of you talk um, before we move on to returning to Baron and Grimm, okay? Um, it's 1149, thank you so much. Really great class. Thank you for all your participation. And I'll see you on Wednesday. I'll stick around if you've got some questions. Otherwise, you are released. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.